Hello and welcome along to Off The Court 2.0, or is it 2.0? The two for me and her, Tams in Greenway. Coming up, anything they can do, we can do too, right? We're talking NSL 2.0, 2.0, and some huge guests as well. We've got the, the guru who professionalised women's football in the UK, Kelly Simmons, and the coach turned director of netball, I think that's what we're calling her, a bit of everything, franchise, something to do like that. Uh, in 2025 at Manchester Thunder is Karen Gregg. Right, Tams in. I've given Karen about 52 titles. You're going to add to it with how you're going to shake netball up now because England netball's plans to make the netball Super League professional, which includes clubs bidding to be part of it. This is all revamped league in 2025. Your thoughts, your feelings, what do you make of it all? My thoughts are still where I sat initially, which is excitement and unicorns and rainbows. And yes, we're going to have a professional league, which is brilliant. What I'm really excited about is hearing from from Kelly and from Greggy about the nitty gritty, because the reality is, even though I can sit with that hat on, you know, I've, I've been in netball a very long time. So the netball geek of me wants all of this, but the Tamsin that works for a company and, and has been in this for, for decades understands that there's got to be a lot of clarity now about how we actually get there. And that's going to be around all those things, strategy, investment, um, how we approach the player, all those kind of nitty gritty, the fan base, we've got to get into those small, 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 Small significant details that we don't really know much about. That that strikes me from these initial, as you say, we all want to get behind it. Great. We all want it to happen. Great. Uh, seen some of the various criteria, including that teams will need access to these 5,000-seater arenas. But there's not much clarity about drilling down there. The hope is that the minute you apply for it, you find out more about what you need to do, right? But would you have wanted to have seen a bit more up front on what's what's the expectation yeah i think it's difficult isn't it because they're never going to put out into the press or into the media or onto x twitter whatever one to call it you know that this is exactly what you need and what it's going to be but the reality is those clubs are going to be asking those questions what are the numbers do they add up where are we going to get that from where does that sit who does it lie on and, and I think the right people are going to need to understand that information for us to move forward. And, and, and you know, we're going to have to look at how other leagues have done it and, and worked and the success that they've brought and, and how we can then transfer that over to ours as well. So, so yeah, I, I want to know. I want to know a bit more detail about it because um, it's going to come around very quickly, 2025, and um, we're going to need to make sure we've got that stuff in place and everyone kind of knows what they're and signing up they for. They have been quite straight with the fact that, yeah, 2025 is this marker point for, for new teams, but that's just the beginning of where we might go and what it might be as well. My One final point to you, Tamsin, as someone that's run a team in Wasps who are no longer with us in the netball sphere, not by their own making we've got to get to a point where it's sustainable right we can't announce this league and then these clubs not be here they've got to be here in well infinitum until the point at which there's that many clubs that we can have promotion relegation right absolutely there's got to be some security around it if you're investing that amount of money there's got to be security there's got to be a plan and the numbers have to add up and they're, they're going to be the questions that the people at the top the ones that make those decisions are going to be asking the dreamers like me can just go in there and promote it all we want but those questions will need so to be answered. So many questions. If you have them, use the hashtag off the court. We'll try and get some more added to it throughout this show then. Next up, how do you turn pro? We'll talk to someone who's been there and done that. What does it take then to turn a league pro? No better person to ask than Kelly mm -hmm. Simmons, ex-director of the FA Women's Super League. I oversaw the, the growth of the WSL for the last five years. Now a consultant on women's sport. Kelly, thank you for coming on off the court initially what do you make of it of netball super league's ideas really exciting i think uh, there's definitely space uh, in the market for um really well presented great women's sport on a regular basis i think it's exciting to see the ambitions of netball to uh, to really turbocharge that domestic game and and deliver professional women's netball so yeah very very exciting uh, ambition i think you must have had many ideas, a, a whole shopping list when you started off. But looking back on it now, is there anything anything that's really key that you think they should look at right at the start? I think uh, when I came in, the first job really was um, sort of around governance and building um, the strategy so that to all the clubs and our stakeholders are aligned uh, against the strategy. We had a big ambition. We wanted to be the best women's league in the world. We wanted to inspire positive change through football. That was something... Um, in terms of that higher purpose that brands really wanted to get behind because it was much more than football itself. It was about how 
um, delivering great women's football could empower women and girls um, and providing opportunities for, for girls, particularly that had never had the opportunity to play and didn't have those opportunities that boys had. So we found that a lot of brands wanted to get behind that. That was obviously important because that was helping us to bring in uh, new revenue and also uh, big marketing budgets of brands like Barclays. So I think having a really clear strategy, you know, a big ambition, um, and then really about building up the team that can help go out and um, uh, deliver the league, um, promote it, build those audiences and attendances, uh, and bring in commercial revenue. All about the team, Tamsin. You know all about that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Kelly, it was, it's quite interesting that hearing you talk about you know getting the right strategy in the brand. A lot have been said about the timing of this. So I think over the years, I've sort of said I've been waiting for this announcement for 15 years. We felt that there's been moments, you know, we could have jumped off the back of the success in 2018 in the Commonwealth Games. We didn't. Obviously, then COVID hit. We had such a good summer with the World Cup. How important is that connection between the national squad doing well and the timing that you approach this and and sort of the launch and the success of, of the league and the competition? Well, I think, you know, certainly in football, there's been a, uh, a massive link between major tournaments and then being able to pull that through into growing audiences and growing attendances in the Women's Super League. And, and for football, those events, uh, if you qualify, come along almost three years out of four. Um, so it's just about as quickly as you can putting the foundations down to make sure that you capitalise on that. Certainly when we hosted the Euros uh, in our own country and obviously went on to win it um, in, in 2022, then, you know, we did a lot of work pre, during and post tournament to make sure that uh, that we were ready to capitalise on that. And we saw a big, big uplift in our attendances and a big uplift in our audiences. And we were absolutely ready for that. So I think it's it's absolutely about working really closely to, with the league and and the federation and 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 the national uh, sort of team in terms of the marketing and comms teams to sort of build up a joint plan with the clubs to make sure that uh, that the, you make the most of those big big sort of what I call peak opportunities where the profile is at its highest uh, and making sure that those people who are enjoying that know where to then go and follow those stars back in the domestic game. That all sounds joined up, which is which is great, right? But how important was it that the Football Association were there and in tandem with the league? So I know that gone on now and, and since you're leaving, you were handing it over to a, a new company. Could that work initially, having a, a completely new company away from the governing body to start things off? Or do you think it's important that both work together? I guess, you know, different models can work. I think um, with the Women's Super League, I came in in September 2018, it was zero revenue um, in terms of external commercial revenue. So um, we were, the FA was investing at the time around £7 million a year in the Women's Super League, the Women's Championship, and uh, the academies um, that, that sit under that. So um, so we needed that, that money. And also, you know, we had a very, very small team of people funded by the FA and so we were hugely reliant on sharing those services uh, across the FA whether that's a sort of back office ones that help you run a company like your your technology your HR your legal etc or whether it was more sort of frontline marketing broadcast etc you know we couldn't have operated without FA money uh, and, and FA people now what now down the line, you know, the, the central revenue is around £18 million. Pounds. We're able to distribute six to seven million back to the clubs. It's ready to come out and stand on its own two feet. And of course, that is the plan over the next few months is that it will become club owned. And, and I think that's the right structure for it, because I think there's a natural conflict of interest of leagues sitting in governing bodies. Um, and, you know, and I could I could see that very much from, from being within it. And so we've always felt that at the right time, it should come out and stand on its own. And of course, it's ready to do that now because it's got the money to do so. Because that's the thing, Tamsin, isn't it? Over the, the years, we've heard a group of clubs here, a group of clubs there say, oh, well, we're going to go and run our own league. Are you a great believer in this happening in tandem with, with England netball, Tamsin? I think what Kelly's talking about is what's really important here. It's getting the strategy right. It's then building where you are at the moment. And, and at the minute, the clubs aren't ready to go it alone. So actually, that that connection has to happen. They have to stay together to start off with. But what I love about what she's talking about is it's grown holistically. And now it's at a stage where the clubs can take that on. Because, yeah, there are huge conflicts of interest. And we have to be wary of that. I think one of the biggest things I've been talking about here, and 
and Kelly, I don't know whether you, you can discuss this as well, is how important it is to take everybody on the journey. So there's a couple of things for me. Getting the clubs, players, MPA involved in what England Netball are doing so they understand the strategy and journey. But I also want to pick up on, on the fan base as well. I think you mentioned there getting that hype around the fans that watch international sport to then want to come every week to the league. And that is something we still haven't done. You know, we know we get people to big events. What we're not doing is that week in, week out. So it's two parts of it for me. Keeping the connection until it's ready to go alone. Brilliant. But that other part is how did you nail that crowd activation of those people that are you know going to the internationals that want to then watch it every single week yeah I think it's uh yeah, it's a great question I think it's for us we were um we made sure that um we were ready in terms of fixtures um coming back um that we were pushing those fixtures all during the tournament that we were promoting um the stars of the tournament where they play um who they play for how you can watch them links to tickets, uh, etc. So that, um, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of fans who, who follow a particular club, but there are a lot of those who follow individual players. Um, and so it's just about, yeah, I think about being ready. We focus on where to put the games in the calendar, the biggest games in the best slots, the big games in the main stadiums, um, etc. So that um, we just, yeah, we try to do everything we could with marketing spend as well and working really closely with the clubs with their marketing spend to make sure that we came back um, and we came back, uh, you know, in big numbers. And, and certainly I felt the pressure. I remember standing watching England lift the trophy at Wembley in the Euros and thinking, whoo, we're really under pressure now <laughs> to pull this through. And so um, that early kickoff and people then believing that, um, you know, the WSL was something absolutely to come and watch in big, big numbers was really important. So we, I remember kicking off, um, you know, at the start of that season with some really big, big crowds in main stadiums and thinking, right, we're off and running. We've got to keep this going. Anything you do differently as you look back on it now? I don't know. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great question. Um, I, I, I don't, not, not really. I just think... Um, no, I just think it's it's just uh, the game. Um, the reason why I think it needs to go to a separate entity and, and it's sort of on that journey to do it is because uh, it needs a laser focus. And I think that um, at times, you know, we had to share people who had other priorities, whether that's England men, England women, women's FA Cup participation, whatever those, you know, there were people very, very busy. And I just, you know... I, I would have liked to have been in a position, I think, where we could have moved quicker to um, having everybody who gets up and in the morning, their first thought and their last thought work-wise is how do we build the Women's Super League and the Women's Championship? How do we how do we grow it? How do we how do we drive that forward? And, and in reality, we had to share it with people who were waking up thinking about a whole range of priorities. And so I would have liked up front probably some more resource to grow quicker. But um, at the end of the day, you know, it is in, it is in a really great place. But um, like everything, the more money you've got, startup money, the quicker you can drive it. Well, Kelly, talking to you is just like talking to Tamsin. I think she eats, sleeps, drinks, everything to do with her <laughs> sport as well. Uh, brilliant to, to have you on. Anything else, Tamsin? No, no. Although, do you want to come and work with Netball for a bit, Kelly? Because there's, there's a project that you might enjoy doing. <laughs> and, and I'll sign up for you. I will literally give you everything from morning to night. So. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to. Give me a ring. <laughs> <laughs> Pivot. Uh, Kelly Simmons, thank you for coming on Off the Court. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to Kelly for coming on Off the Court. Well, joining us now, Karen Gregg, not only the head coach of Manchester Thunder, but stepped up to become franchise director as well. Karen, thank you for coming on. Your thoughts then on these plans? My initial thoughts are exciting. Like, you know, what netballer wouldn't want to be a professional athlete? Like, and that's that's the thing for me. So, you know, your initial thoughts are, wow, as I'm sure everybody else's initial thoughts are, wow. But this runs a lot deeper and it's going to be interesting to see how the, there's, you know, there's lots of hurdles to jump over here. There's lots of hoops to jump through and it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out over the next three to four months. One of the things, Tamsin, on that point that, that Kelly was talking about was this having that clear, clear strategy from the start. But I guess the, the advantage also the Football Association had was money. 
right? Some of those figures she was talking about, I thought, where's netball finding that? Yeah, and, and I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, when this all first got announced, I did my ultimate thing. I'm the dreamer, right? This is what I've wanted for, for 15 years. But as I keep saying, there's a lot to do between now and 2025. And if you just pick up on, on what Greggy was saying there about the hurdles and the hoops to, join, to go through. Well, the first one is investment, right? So when you sit there listening to Kelly and she's just whacking out those millions of pounds numbers, you go, ooh. And, you know, having working in a club, I'm well aware that there are concerns around the investment like you know this is not just going to happen we're not just going to magically get all this money together so we need to start working on where that investment's coming from the the other part is the strategy the clear plan so you know even even interestingly talking about um clubs open to tender and this being this open process brilliant in some sense in the dreamer world but the the other side of me the flip side goes well hang on do we want clubs in big cities are we moving away from universities do we want existing clubs that are in there if the existing clubs are in there, is it about their fan base? Is it about stadium? Like, there's a load of other questions that I think are going to come out in this next 18 months that we we can't sit back, that we are going to have to ask and address and make sure that we're all clear in this strategy. So eventually we can get to a point where it might become club owned and we might be able to pull that away a little bit and this league can thrive and survive on its own. And that we also learn from the stuff that's been and gone overseas at the moment where we're not in a situation where everyone's up against each other. I take it, though, given all that, it's still something you will be bidding for, Karen. Um, we, we'll obviously put in our expression of interest and off the back of that, we'll then find out what the tender process actually is because nobody fully understands what that looks like yet. So until we express any kind of interest and we get that process through and we have to then go through that process over the next few months, um, we, you know, it's the nitty gritty behind that that is really important. Like Tamsin said, the figures, what does it look like? Is it achievable? At the minute, we, yes, of course we're interested. Yes, we would love to be a part of it, but it has to be realistic. So, yeah, you know, it's, we're looking forward to putting that expression of interest in, see what that tender process is and making sure that we're in a position that it's viable for us, us to make try and make it work. I'm a bit surprised, Tamsin, that, Teams like Manchester Thunder have to, you don't have to comment on this, Karen, but have to have to bid for it. You know, there's a there's a club with with heritage that's got the pathway that that we've seen play in these big stadia already. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's where, you know, I, I will always challenge you. Everybody knows me that knows I'll be honest. So, you know, I, I know as much as everybody else knows at the moment. I know that there's a plan. I know that there's an idea. I know that we want to move forward. I fully back Claire Nelson in, in, in it. In anybody can do it. She can do it. Take our league professional. However, there are there are issues around that because, you know, I, I would like to think that there were set clubs in the in this system at the moment that have built a fan base that have historically understood the game, that know what they want to do that have the links, the ownership, the partnerships to take the sport forward. And I'd like to think that we're proactively working with those guys. And it comes down to how I coach a team, right? I talk about this all, all, all the time. Everyone will be treated fairly, but not necessarily equally. So, you know, your ageing player, like your Manchester Thunders, that have been in it for ages and have established something, they, they already have a few notches up here that we can go in at a different level. And I would be approaching other people that I want to work with that have the right backing, you know, do we want to go in and across to multi-sport? So is rugby partnerships the answer? We've got Rhinos, we've got Saracens, like, is that the way forward? Do we want standalone clubs? So I, I do think it's, it's a different approach. And one that I'd perhaps like to see more transparency on is, is it just a bit of a show that we're going open tender to everyone or having the netball got the plan behind the scenes that we perhaps haven't been allowed to look at yet. And that's fine if that's what's happening. But I do think that transparency has got to come to light in the next few weeks when we are going for tenders because, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think that the clear strategy is there and that teams like Thunder will be included and, you know, Saris and, and teams that want to be in it that are already in it that can prove they can be should be given that added advantage and perhaps not have to go through that same process. Yeah, what do you I think, want to see, Karen? For me, it's about security as well. You know, I think, you know, we've, we've been around a long time and um, T and I have discussed previously the number of teams that have actually played across the Netball Super Cup, Super League and what that looks like. And, and I think for me, there has to be some kind of security that you're in this league and you're in this league for good. Um, and, and that has to be, in my eyes, the approach that's taken here. You know, we, we can't be 
te- teams don't probably will not want to be given a tender, a license, whatever that looks like, to be in five, six, seven, eight years' time, have that taken away. Um, because ultimately, we don't know figures yet, but we're going to be in it for a lot of money. So we need to make sure that the investment is going somewhere that's sustainable. Um, and that, that's the key thing for me. Yeah, look, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I'd love to see in the future, it, like I say, it become more of a club owned product because I think that's the way that things should move. And, and you're right, you can't, you can't go into something for sort of five years, invest. And we, we, we're talking, if we honestly want to go fully professional, I did an interview about this yesterday, like they were like, well, what are the numbers? And I use your imagination because this is not just about the clubs investing the money into the players. It's going to be the umpires, the coaches, the, everything else that comes around this. So I don't think we are at a stage where we can sort of tender for a few years and then if you're not doing very well, we just drop you out of the league with the amounts that we're asking people to put in and invest. So I would like that more security. We see it happen around the leagues. You know, um, there are other examples of leagues where this happens, where clubs don't, it, there's no promotion relegation that you can have this ownership that you're in it for the long run. And that would help us build fan base. And I think it's where our sport's at at the moment. We're not football, we're netball. And we've got to understand that. So I, I would I would also like to see that happen. Um, a bit more transparency around the actual numbers that are going to happen as well. And Greggy, one thing to pick up on this, the players have been kind of quiet on this sort of agenda as well. Like I would have thought it would be like massive excitement around, you know, it being professional league. Um, but one of the things I think is quite interesting is, um, you know, how much is professional? You know, what is that pay for them? And I personally think we need to take baby steps. I don't think we can just drop in in year one and go, right, everyone's fully professional. Woo, let's go. Um, I don't know your thoughts on that and the, and the communication you've had with your players. Yeah, obviously we, we put out the communication to the players that we received from England Netball and the MPA. And there wasn't a lot of volume around it um, from our perspective. Um, I think the key thing for me is any discussions that I'm having with athletes around what does professionalisation look like, what, you know, what do I foresee it? And again, this is just my opinion, and it's very similar to UT. It's small steps. Um, and I wouldn't expect, if, if we if we were to get a franchise and we were to crack on, I wouldn't expect all my athletes to be full-time in probably the first five years at least. I, you know, I don't think that's doable. For me, the salaries are going to be important if we're going to be asking players to upstick their lives and move um you know, and for it to be full, full time. A lot of our players that are currently sat in our league are are already, you know, in jobs, in universities and have got really good career paths. So to expect to pull them away from that for what we don't even know the salaries are going to look like yet, you know, it's going to be a really difficult thing. So for me, within the first five years, you're you're probably looking small percentages of, of your players. So if you've got a playing group, just throwing a number out there, like we've got now a 12 and a three, if that was the way that we move forward, um, you know, how many of that 12 would you expect to be full time? And what does your training look like? You know, how many do we move from night training to day training? How many of your athletes are going to be able to to um to do that so there's a huge picture and i think baby steps is definitely the way the way forward with the athletes and you know i i would never scare monger and the athletes into saying i would expect you all to be full-time within the first two years and go and give up your job as a doctor like i just it's not going to happen um and i think the small steps approach across the whole thing you know the, the fan base, like you've touched on, T, is crucial. And it's those it's that fan base of those younger ages that we should be targeting to want to be those full-time athletes in the future. So your kids that are now, you know, 11, 12, 13, they're the ones that we're probably targeting that are going to be full-time. Your ones that are kind of 17, 18, 19 and, and already in the league, that's going to look very different for them initially, I think. And you can't, Tam's in... The strikes me to what Karen's saying there you can't have one team Manchester Thunder up against my team Caroline's hot dogs or whatever we're called but you, you oh, wait, is that what we're doing I just had a hot dog that's what I'm thinking um but, but you can't have Manchester Thunder paying you know six players to be pro and I can only afford because I'm not selling many hot dogs one player because suddenly then your league's not going to be as competitive is it so they've got to balance that all the way through yeah, absolutely. We, we we see the problem with that already. You know, you take your England players and you whack them in a centralised programme. Brilliant for them, not for the others that are only training two or three times a week and not getting to train with them. Like That's why the gap grows between that group. And that's why England takes so many players, because it's like, well, 
<laughs> otherwise what, what's happening so yeah you, you absolutely can't I keep talking about the four-pronged approach. It has to be governing body, it has to be clubs, it has to be players, and it has to be MPA, and they have to be involved. You cannot start just branching off. That doesn't mean someone can't lead, absolutely, but the, the clubs are going to have to have some clear direction about what that looks like, and, and the salaries are going to be important because that is going to dictate already, like you say, starting here, getting there, when do your training times, how many times can you get them in? Um, and they're the kind of conversations that will have to start. It's the nitty gritty. The, the big dream is brilliant. It's out there. Perfect. That's what we want to do. We haven't got a lot of time. This is going to fly by, like absolutely fly by. If we're doing a tender process and getting clubs in. So I'm intrigued over the next few months to see what information we're given, what, what that's actually going to look like and how we can then actually start working together. And, and it will be a very, um, it's got to be a brand netball approach. Like all the clubs buying in are going to have to, work together on this to make sure that, that we haven't got sort of super clubs and the other ones just catching up otherwise they they can't sustain it either and it won't be any fun so i i think there's a bigger bigger picture here and that leadership uh, of selling the strategy of what it actually is is going to be the next crucial part of this project karen obviously i want to sign you out to be the inaugural coach of caroline's hot dogs but whilst you're running it <laughs> Yeah, you can make the tea. Well, you can make saying, the tea. Am I doing a tat? Is that? Yeah, is that exactly. Mm, well, I don't know. Might not get in the starting That's team. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any final <laughs> thoughts from you, Karen? Not about Tamsin's uh, wing attack skills. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, as as I said earlier, it's it's an exciting prospect. It is, um, but we have to get it right from day one. Absolutely, Tamsin, Karen, thank you. A netball super league two point I think they've called it. We won't see the changes in terms of teams until 2025. But next up for us on Sky Sports is the South Africa series in December. You can watch it live across the whole of Sky Sports. I know Karen will be there giving her thoughts too. Can't wait for that as well. I'll follow you all on. What's the netball group now that you're all on? It's not Twitter, it's X. Your watch alongs, Karen. Oh, the noggle box oh. people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was kind of a COVID thing, but we, we still communicate every now and again. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm Is not going to follow the knuckle box anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're all off my team. You can't be yeah. part of the hot dogs. Uh, Karen, Tamsin, thank you. Be part of Off the Court. You can use the hashtag Off the Court anytime you like. Bye for now. Sky Sports. Feel it all.